Henry Wood Newinson was a British writer and war correspondent. He was born in 1856 in Leicester, the son of solicitor George Newinson and Mary Jane Wood. He attended Shrewsbury School in Christchurch, Oxford. In 1884, he married his childhood friend Margaret Wynne Jones, the two having one son, the painter Christopher Newinson. After death in 1933, he married his friend and suffragist Evelyn Sharp. In 1897, he became the war correspondent for the Daily Chronicle during the Greco-Turkish War. He also reported on the Second World War and World War I. In 1904, he investigated illegal slave trade in Angola conducted by the Portuguese, sending seized voluntary workers to Sao Tome. Newinson following despite his ill health and publishing his expose in 1905. In 1907, he co-founded the Men's League for Women's Suffrage. In 1940, bombing made his home uninhabitable, and so he moved to Chipping Camden, Gloucestershire. He died there in 1941. We will review his 1920 Original Sinners. Qualis Artifacts, the best story in the book, has Nero leave the places where everyone was forced to let him win and hail his triumph as a hero of the art and come back to Rome. Therein a massive audience is imprisoned, a host of prisoners whipped and beaten to make them sufficiently enthusiastic, while Nero blathers on on stage. But, you know, not enough to make him do an encore, heaven forbid. After reciting a poem whose author he had killed for daring to say he had written it, he retires to his bed and dreams of long years of life and stopping his rivals in the empire with the power of his music playing alone. The year is 68 AD. Sly's awakening concerns the central framing device of Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew, with Christopher Sly thinking he's a lord still, and being made fun of by his beggarly drinking mates. A life on the ocean wave has a professor go out to commit suicide on board the ship to Avery, as all his pupils hate and humiliate him. But in the end all conspires against him and he goes back, now the personal friend of the British consul. Pongo's illusion as two enterprising Europeans in Africa sees a chimpanzee, and instead of decapitating it for fun as they wished to initially, try to teach it to be a man, end up flogging it to near death, lash to the back of a severely flogged woman, after the creature dared not liking them doing that very much. In the end they make him an alcoholic. Sitting at a play has a politician visit a play with his new young wife, and the player recounts his entire life including his distant treatment of his impoverished alcoholic brother and his family, before his wife and the rest drag him screaming from the theatre, the woman seemingly not caring about anything she just witnessed, which was a sweet enough touch. A transformation scene concerns Jim, a fisherman on board the steamship Britain, coming back from a hole to go drown his life in the debauchery he has sunk to after his wife left him. But after she is pestered by a crowd, he steps in, busts one of their heads in and takes her home along with his infant he had never seen. The act of fear has Mr. Clarkson visiting Niagara Falls and meeting Cloghorn, a Baptist professor of ethics, who admits to have put his hand down the top of a girl's muslin dress at the Republican convention. And then, when an ambiguous report in a newspaper seems to implicate him, he jumps into the stream and is dashed below the falls. Turns out the news wasn't about him. In Diocletian's day has the former emperor meet a messenger from Maximian, another former emperor, in his voluntary exile in Dalmatia, and refusing the offer to return to the throne, while showing Julianus a feast at a local amphitheatre where a bunch of deserters are hacked to bits and a few Christians are devoured by lions. The title story, The Niagara Affair, and the tale of Pongo reveal an undercurrent of dark sardonic humour in Newinson, and one only wishes he developed it more.